I want to thank everyone for joining us today for um, a very exciting presentation and discussion. We are honored and privileged to have with us Robin Doolittle, who is an award-winning journalist from the Globe and Mail and has done a couple of really, uh, well, she's done an extensive, um, she has an extensive and long career, but a, a couple of groundbreaking um, investigative journalism series that have been profiled in the Globe that have really had significant real-world impact. Um, she's also the author of two books. I'll get to her bio in a minute, but she's a very accomplished journalist. She's going to be discussing the power, the power gap, gender discrimination in law firms, universities, and corporations. And this event is co-sponsored by the Law and Feminism Research Group at the Faculty of Law in conjunction with the Gender and Law Association, which is the student group concerned about the same set of issues. So she's going to analyze her findings from one of these groundbreaking investigative series that has been running in the Globe and Mail titled the, the Power Gap. And it documents the ways in which, uh, <clears throat> despite the perception that some have that we have achieved gender parity and gender equality, in fact, gender equality in Canadian workplaces has significantly stalled. And not only in terms of compensation, but in terms of representation at the highest levels of decision-making, women still lag behind men. So the sort of analysis and the significance of the findings is the focus of Robin's talk today. So Robin is a member of the Globe and Mail's investigative team. Uh, she's twice won Canada's Missioner Award for her outstanding journalism. Since she joined the Globe in 2014, she has probed suspicious business co um, contracts, political corruption, Canada's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure everyone is familiar with her Unfounded series, which has had really significant real world implications in terms of um, the police tendency to unfound sexual assault cases. And it prompted a national overhaul of policy training and practices amongst police forces across the country. And that series was awarded a National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism, among other honors, including two awards at the International Online Journalism Awards. Her latest book, Had It Coming, What's Fair in the Age of Me Too, was shortlisted for the RBC Taylor Prize for Nonfiction, and Robin was named Journalist of the Year in 2017. And I'm sure there's even further accolades, but I think that gives you a sense of her um, many talents and accomplishments and what she has done. So the format for today is that Robin's going to speak to us for about 45 minutes. And that will be followed by a discussion period of Q&A, and you will be able to type your questions into the chat, and then one of the hosts will read them, and Robin will have a chance to engage with um, ideas and questions that come up from the audience. So without further ado, Robin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We're really excited to hear from you on this series. My pleasure. And if you have questions while I'm talking uh, and you want to pop them in the Q&A, I can also keep an eye on it if something comes up in the moment. Um, <clears throat> really quickly, housekeeping, my headphone jack has decided that this is the time when it wants to die. And so here we are, uh, which is fine, uh, except that I can't control the background noise in my office. There's no one here right now, but you never know. The Globe and Mail is not a super Russia's place. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay. So as Melanie mentioned, I have most recently been uh, working on this series called the power gap. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today with a particular focus on some of the research that we've found concerning universities and also law firms for obvious reasons. But why don't I back up to kind of the very beginning of, of why we started looking at this issue. <clears throat> So as uh, Melanie also mentioned, I spent um, a long time working on a series called Unfounded that was a review of how police handle sexual assault cases. And kind of towards the, oh, geez, it must have been <clears throat> early 2018, was still working on Unfounded, but thinking about what to do, what to do next. Um, Unfounded had kind of been 2017, 2018, what's the next project? At the time I was pregnant and preparing to go on my second maternity leave. Um, the discussion around Me Too had started to evolve beyond sexual violence to one more broad, to a more, a more broad discussion about equity in the workplace. 
um, it really wasn't surprising that women were still being sexually harassed at work because women are treated as second class citizens by all measures at work. And so that's kind of where my head was at. And around this time, there was a report out of the UK, a, um, some legislative changes there had required the BBC to release some pay information. And a journalist uh, learned that she was making dramatically less than her male counterpart. And so yeah, maternity leave, me too, the stuff out of, of the UK. <clears throat> it got me thinking like this would be a really interesting area to explore, not dissimilar from Unfounded, which set out to ask this question of are police actually, or is the justice section is the justice system actually biased against women? Um, I wanted to know, is there a way to actually determine whether two people with similar qualifications are making different salaries because of their gender? Really hard question to answer, obviously, but something that's always frustrated me about the pay equity discussion is, you're probably familiar with the stat that always comes up, women make 13% less than men. I've always thought, well, is that the overall workforce? Is that in every job? And it is, it's the overall average of all women working compared to all men. And I think it's easily dismissed because of that, because I think what people really want to know is, is the guy sitting next to me doing the same job, making more money? <clears throat> that was the premise of the series. Um, the challenge here, of course, is that salaries are secret. Um, to, to do this properly, we would need an actual workplace with all the names and genders and all of their salaries, and then ideally be able to explore the different job titles within that. Um, there's one exception though of where salaries aren't secret, and that's the public sector. And this isn't just core government. This is any entity that's owned or funded or run through government entities. So there's core government, like your provincial governments, your city halls. And then you can expand further into crown corporations. So crown corporations are structured like private companies, but they uh, are public. So things like the LCBO, Metrolinx, um, these kind of, uh, a lot of your hydro distributors, some of your internet providers in different provinces or, or distributors. Um, there's uh, the Ontario Securities Commission, like these types of places, these arm's length agencies. Um, and universities, I think I mentioned, uh, crowns, universities, city hall, and provincial government. So those are the four that we focused on in the initial collection of data. We pulled sunshine lists. These are these public sector salary debt databases um, from uh, across the country. And now we need to figure out the genders though of, uh, of these individuals, because that's obviously not included on the sunshine list. So we, um, we made an arrangement with Statistics Canada to apply a gender analysis onto the first names of the individuals in our data set. 90% of names in this country are associated with a particular gender at least 95% of the time. I know it's a bit of a tongue twister, but if you can wrap your brain around it, it's a very high level of certainty that a particular name is associated with a particular gender. So we did that and um, there were some gaps, of course, and then in those cases, we manually researched the gender of those individuals by reading bios or contacting them. Um, we did want to look at race as well in this analysis, but first names are not a reliable, first names or last names for that matter, <clears throat> are not a reliable indicator of race. So what we did do, I think we had something like, I think we had 90,000 around that names in our data set. So it wasn't possible to kind of manually check all of them. But what we did is we focused on the top 1% of earners across the board and also the head of all the organizations. I think there was about 1,100 people in that group. And we manually checked or researched and contacted all of those individuals to add that, that layer of information. And what we found um, is that while salary was important and there was still a wage gap, the bigger issue here was just the lack of women. There were um, fewer women by almost every measure you could look at. Um, so much of the focus is on women at the very top, the CEO level, the, the C-suites, but women were missing uh, throughout the 
pipeline. When we did uh, job searches, uh, we, we pulled job titles, people who were at the manager level, supervisor, director, executive director, president, vice president. Um, women were underrepresented in all of those groups dramatically uh, in many cases. We also took um, each individual entity and divided it up into different salary bands. So you could see you know, the top 10% of earners bottom 10% of earners. And again, women dramatically underrepresented at the top, but also in the pipeline on the way to the top. And this trend more or less held across most entities, as well as the overall what we called silos. So like all universities, all crown corporations, all city hall, all core provincial governments. And I think the real headline for, for us here and where we ultimately decided to shift our focus to this question of power away from just purely looking at salaries um, is that we, um, we tend to think of the glass ceiling as being at the very top of an institution, but women aren't getting through middle management. So this is why uh, you know it, it's um, probably counterproductive, I think, to focus so much at the very top and also to focus so much on salaries because Again, you know, there was a wage gap that was 100% true. And even when we look at men and women in similar um, roles at the same level, there was a wage gap. But it was relatively small, like often, you know, three, four, five percent, which compounded over a career is still significant. Don't get me wrong. But um, the real thing, again, was just uh, like I'm looking at I'm trying to pull up this information here. Um, like at the top leaders, for example, at the publicly owned corporations, the crown corporations, 30% of the top jobs um, were men, right? And look, this is when you kind of, you think of the gap, uh, of, of the wage gap, like that's really what's contributing to the overall gap on the average is that the women are concentrated in lower paying jobs. So this is the first phase of the series that we, that we rolled out and, um, as part of that, so we had an initial launch of kind of the data, introducing this concept of what the power gap was, which is again, looking at this, the gender inequities um, by more than just a dollar figure. Oh, I should also note, um, when we actually did uh, look at the the top 1% of owner, of um, earners and the, the highest um, executive level people at each organization, um, the vast majority were men. Of the women who did make it through, the vast majority, vast, vast majority were white women. Um, I don't think that's a huge surprise to anybody, but I think it's worth just reinforcing. So that was the first phase. Um, the next bank of stories that we did was looking at why is this? Um, to do this, I, I spoke with dozens of employment lawyers across the country. And this is where I think it's relevant for you guys, because um, it inspired a whole second branch of this series that I wasn't initially planning on doing. But I'm trying to connect with people who are experiencing gender discrimination at work or challenges and what's that look like? What do they do in those situations? Um, so yeah, many dozens of, of employment lawyers across the country, just seeing if they had any leads. And I was shocked at how often the conversation ended with, okay, and off the record, do you want to hear what happened to me at my firm? And this is when I started hearing stories of the wage gaps within law firms, but also um, the barriers to you know, getting good referrals, getting put on the best cases, um, being sidelined once you have kids, being sidelined if your partners think you might have kids, um, you know, lack of promotion, having a harder time on partner track, climbing in general, sexual harassment, problems with networking, like the, the list went on and on and on. And uh, it was just so crystallizing to me because ultimately what that series, what those series of stories showed when we were trying to look at what was causing the gap is that while Canada, not unlike the Unfounded series, which found that we have uh, great laws around sexual um, assault and violence, um, we have great laws around discrimination, um, but they're very rarely enforced. The, the mechanisms to, to hold um, employers accountable on them uh, are, not, are not useful in many ways. Um, for example, as, as you all know, we have the human rights tribunal system, which has been set up to deal with many of these cases, and it is so dramatically underfunded and under-resourced, sometimes purposely, that it can take, you know, five years. I encountered a woman who waited 12 years to get um, before an adjudicator to get a decision. <clears throat> 
in, in real in the real world, if you're encountering a problem at work, uh, let's say that you're encountering pregnancy discrimination, um, your kid is going to be in school before you get a decision about whether you were mistreated. The damages are very low. I found they were mostly between kind of five and twenty thousand um, dollars. If you win your case, the other side doesn't pay your legal costs. So if you've hired an outside lawyer, so much of your winnings are going to go to this person. Um, and and there's good reasons that there's not costs associated with it. But again, it just makes all the the tribunal process unattractive to a lot of people. And so what ends up happening, I found, is that many um, women who encounter issues at work end up quitting and taking um, some sort of, of settlement. And, you know, it, the settlement isn't isn't uh, called, you know, uh, resolution of gender discrimination. It's just, okay, this didn't work out. Let's just, let's just part ways. And, uh, oh, by the way, there's a confidentiality clause if you cash this check. And so what that meant is that we're not even hearing about so many of these cases. The actual extent of the problem is greatly obscured. I found this was a major problem in universities. And I don't know if that's just because um, universities offer a certain amount of autonomy to faculty, especially tenured faculty, to speak about it. But I heard many cases of um, you know, men running into trouble at universities and just transferring to another school. And then the other school can't legally warn the other school because they've got this mutual agreement or or women having to move around um, and, and, you know, the problem never actually being exposed within that specific school. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that, that series of stories ran that was looking at the potential causes and the, the lack of funding and, and ways to enforce the law were really important. And then of course, we also looked at the, which I, I don't need to get into here because I'm sure you're all well versed on the just um, cultural uh, realities that, you know, these stereotypes and biases that we all hold inside of us uh, that we've just been raised with that we don't even necessarily notice um, hold women back in the workplace, women and, and other diversity seeking groups where uh, the traditional idea of, of people who are in charge, natural leaders don't necessarily fit with women or racialized people, um, queer people, disabled people. These are breaking the norms of what we see as, as a real leader. So this is when um, I wanted to return to the lawyer question because it just again it just fascinated me that the in these law firms these employment lawyers who are kind of the knights the warriors for these people encountering problems in their job are unable to protect themselves in their own law firms so started speaking to you know more and more law firms and really wanted to get into the guts of some of these places and explore the inequities but of course again it's that that challenge where uh, salaries are not public and I think you know this is a really good area to explore maybe at the end of this is what do we actually do about these issues um but but for now i'll leave that we we, we did look at the lawyers in public institutions but of course the gaps are not as big in public institutions if you're going to you know to work for government because it's um you know like at the provincial government because it's uh it's kind of a set rate and then when you're looking at say the the crown corporations there's there, there really weren't that many lawyers at each entity so you couldn't kind of draw conclusions of um, evaluating one person against the another um but luckily through some uh really fun journalism uh shenanigans is the wrong word but that's the word i'm going to use for now was able to view confidential um pay data for for a major Bay Street law firm this was the first in this series which ran earlier the first in the in the law part of this um I, I was able to view the the pay gap at Castles Brock and it was really astonishing it was 25 percent at the equity partner level so women equity partners were making I think it was two hundred thousand dollars less on average than their male counterparts at the equity partner level and when you actually think about that compounded over many years, it's it's just a staggering amount. 
after that ser that story ran, um, another law firm, Aaron and Bearless, uh, agreed to, I, I was putting this out to all of the major law firms, like, would you guys consider voluntarily disclosing your, your gaps? I'm not asking you to send me your compensation grid, you know, with all the names or everything, but to talk about what your actual gender gap are, or what your actual gender gap is. And Aaron and Bearless agreed to, to kind of voluntarily disclose theirs, and it was a 17% gap. But what was interesting is that the lawyers who had been practicing for 20 years or less, the gap was zero. And then recently this fall, I was able to finally publish a story showing that the, the wage gap at Blake's, um, uh, you know, one of the seven sisters was also 25%, similar to, to Castle's. But at Blake's, what that dollar amount actually translated to was $371,000 per year, which is, again, just like a completely staggering number. Um, and what was really interesting to me with the Blake's data, I was able to overlap um, the, uh, the partners with their year of call. So to see how many people actually, um, like what the gaps were at different levels. I, I was hoping to be able to compare kind of apples to apples, the lawyers called in this year versus the lawyers called in this year. But there were actually so few women represented in each year that it was impossible to reach meaningful conclusions because you know, you're looking at the salary of six men versus one woman. If she was making a crazy amount of money, then the, the gap went up crazy. If she was underpaid, it, it just wasn't useful. Um, but when you I kind of grouped certain years together, and what I found that was really interesting was the women who were in their, probably in their 50s, who were called in the 90s, that was where the gap was the largest. And it was something like 38%, like it was well over half a million dollars, crazy amount of money. And this was really interesting to me because I think for every employer, what, what we're hearing is... Um, we're going to fix these inequities. You know, we're we're getting these new policies in place. If you look at the most recent hires, the gaps are not that big, but they, in many ways, we're kind of just like writing off the previous generations who are still in the workforce. That it's like, well, it's too far gone. Some of the issues that I heard about in law firms that came up over and over again that I think are relevant to other sectors as well. Um, the uh, you know the it's it's a business. Um, that's reliant on, on your book of business, the clients that you have. And I found uh, that women repeatedly told me, you know, they were less likely to get invited to kind of social events at work with the, with the guys. Um, and therefore were then maybe less likely to be put on a, a desirable case that it's, it's human nature to form relationships with people who remind you of yourself, who you see things they have in common with. And so, um, people were getting uh, referrals and, and put on the best cases. Like they're frankly, like often older um, white male partners would then kind of pass off a, oh, look, a, a great uh, connection to the young white male lawyer. And this is no fault of that lawyer and he might do an amazing job uh, with that case, but it's about who isn't getting those opportunities and trying to correct that. And these are some of the causes of the of the kind of historical buildup of inequities that have have happened. That these these are harder to account for because it gets back into kind of human behavior and how you're forming those connections and relationships. And then also the the professional cost of speaking out about this stuff. Um, you know, some of the equity partners that I interviewed who were women about this about the gap. Um, they pointed out, you know, it, it's it's kind of career suicide to to complain in some ways because um, you know I am very well compensated. I make a you know whatever like some some people are making a million dollars a year. Um, if they were a man, would they be making one point four million dollars a year? This is not a particularly sympathetic debate to the public, especially at this time. But I I do think it's really important because when you think about if women at the very highest levels can't have equity in their job then what sort of hope is there for, um, for other women? And, uh, and the other thing is like lawyers in particular was so fascinating to me because there is no deal in this country that gets signed, no law that gets passed without the input of lawyers. And I think when, when you think about the, the culture within law, that is going to permeate into those deals. And, and um, you know, certainly you're seeing, I think, some movement 
in the corporate world uh, of um, companies demanding diversity uh, for, you know, if they're going to take on a contract or a pitch, they, they, want, they want their law firm to have a diverse group of lawyers representing them. Um, so this is kind of how you force that change. And uh, having lawyers at the table who are drafting those contracts kind of promoting this idea, I think is really important. And now I say that, and I believe the, you know, the lawyer at Coca-Cola who kind of really spearheaded this and made this thing was um, resigned or, or was forced out uh, not long after these, the kind of implementing these policies. So it, it's really tricky. Like these, these questions are really complicated to get at. Um, I do want to spend just a couple seconds talking about universities as well, um, because there is obviously also a lot of overlap, I think, with um, with law and universities. Um, the thing that I thought was really interesting with schools was the wage gap at universities was we looked at universities over uh, over time. We went back and took Sunshine List going back 20 years. And um, and adjusted for inflation because you know the 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 threshold for disclosure on a sunshine list um, if you make over a hundred thousand dollars you get disclosed in Ontario and that's been the way it's been since the 90s so we adjusted to account for the fact that a hundred thousand dollars from the late 1990s is not the same as today but what we found is that um, you know back in the 90s universities were dramatically male like at, at this level very much men. Today that that's shifted. They're they're more or less equal, but the very top top jobs um, and and uh, not just the the president and vice presidents, like all the jobs at the at the highest echelons, and in the highest salary echelons, have virtually not changed. So again, like this is now twenty years later. This is a full generation of people and still haven't broken through. Um, women are dramatically concentrated in the lowest salary bands. So um, looking at uh, a chart here now, and I can post this link in the chat, um, although it's behind a paywall, so maybe you won't be able to see it. Um, dun, dun, dun. The screenshot, but yeah, like the lowest salary bands in 1999, um, women represented 12% of the highest salary bands and 12% of the lowest salary bands. Pretty much even, right? Fast forward to 2019, women are 26% at the highest salary band, 27% at the second highest, 30% at the third highest. So you can see we're about like a quarter to one third. And in the lowest salary bands, they're 47% of the lowest salary band. And the lowest salary band, remember, is still that like 100 and about $40,000 earning. These are, this is not like, we're not comparing kind of um, cleaning staff or whatnot. Um, the, so we got 47%, 41%, 39%. I'm gonna take a screenshot here because I think it's just so uh, helpful. Robin, there's um, also some questions about your data analysis. I don't know if you want to take them at the end or now, just like some of it. Why don't I just, yeah, maybe I'll like wrap this up. Maybe, yeah, uh, no um, no, no. and we'll, we'll, uh, and then we can do the questions about the data analysis because there's lots of good questions about the data analysis. Um, but yeah, just like this, this concept of it's just not getting better and progress has really stalled, um, particularly as we're talking about getting through the middle. And just like in kind of closing, the the things that I um, I'm really interested in now is like so what do we actually do about it, right? And I think if I had to think of one like the biggest the biggest thing would be transparency. I think um, you know you've seen in the UK there's a law that any place that has more than um, I think it's 200 employees has to disclose uh, their wage gap data their gender wage gap data. And some are, are also adding in the data um, or the gap between racialized staff and non-racialized staff and other metrics as well. That's the overall number. There are other countries, um, I believe Scandinavian country, where you can, you can look up what your neighbors are, are making. Um, I know that's kind of uncomfortable for us uh, as a society, like that's not something that we're necessarily comfortable with, but transparency is is ultimately the the key to all of this i um you know i again i'm not saying that i think employers need to publish everyone's name with their salary but within your institution i think it would be i certainly i heard this over and over again from people advantageous to know what your what your colleagues like the salary band at least like where are you fitting 
I interviewed many women and almost all of them were, worked in the university sector. I don't know if that's just coincidence or how that worked out, but who told me that they were offered a dean position or, um, you know, another very high, high uh, leadership position. And they were able to negotiate because they looked up their, their predecessor's salary on the sunshine list. And that if they hadn't been able to do that, they actually would have had to accept a, a lower, um, or they probably would have been paid less because they were offered much less. And it was only when they had that kind of evidence. Um, one of the things that I heard over and over again of an, um, a cause of the, the wage gap is that women don't um, heard this from many people <laughs> that women, oh, women don't negotiate as well. Women accept lower starting salaries. And, and you actually look at the research, you know, women, women do negotiate. They just don't get what they're trying to negotiate for. Um, they're also penalized for negotiating because they're again, breaking these, these, uh, these gender silo silos that we're supposed to be in of how we're supposed to act that, oh, she's being arrogant or she's asking for more than she's worth. I interviewed one woman who was offered a director position at a not-for-profit and there was a posted salary band on the job application. <clears throat> uh, I think it was like a, like a $5,000 swing uh, in, in the salary range. And they offered her in the middle of the, maybe it was a $10,000 range and they offered her kind of in the middle and she um, negotiated for an extra two or $3,000 still within the range. And they sent her a letter, which I obtained, and I read it, that rescinded the offer uh, and said, we think you should apply somewhere that's more in line with your salary expectations. And again, this was a person who was given the job, who uh, was only trying to negotiate within the posted range of what the institution was trying to, um, or was willing to pay in the first place. So um, if, she, if she had had a, a, a document showing that her, her predecessor had been paid X amount, it, it kind of takes some of the uh, the possibilities for bias and stereotypes to creep up. So why don't I leave that there for now um, and check a couple of the questions um, on the... There's three questions about the data analysis asking about if you were able to consider intersectionality, whether or not you were able to consider um, women's uh, status as mothers, as kind of a relevant factor about whether or not women made it to the top. And also if you had any data that allowed for looking at the gap between men as a group and racialized women. Right. And I suspect in the last one from what you said, you might not have because you didn't have the, the data on race, but I'm not sure if you were, able, that would be a very interesting comparison. For sure. So let's start at the top with the question of, I presume this also includes transgender women um, around the, uh, the names. So again, how we did this was based on the probability that your first name was associated with a particular gender 95% of the time. So anyone who has a first name that fit in that group was, was included. So for example, my name is Robin with a Y which I would, can be, I would um, consider to be an extremely gendered name because it's got the feminine Y, but actually it didn't meet the threshold. Robin fell in the 90 to 95% window. Um, so all the Robins with a Y would not have been included and we would have had to manually research them if they were gonna skew numbers. So if a, um, a trans woman's name was Susan, um, then, um, then they would have, qualified. And if it, uh, if they, if they were going by Ashley, it would not have because Ashley fell within that range below the 95%. And uh, it just really wasn't possible to, we we're obviously very interested in, in adding an, um, that element into this. We were hoping to look at the workforce by, by many different measures of diversity. And unfortunately, like it was really just gender that we were able to do. And on the mother question, like this is a similar thing, um, which gets to another big, big problem is the lack of data in this country is this was not a, this data set was one that we created. This is not something that anyone in the country had ever done before uh, to actually look at the gaps within institutions. Um, 
And by that, I mean, we know the over, we know, uh, you know, Statistics Canada releases what the wage gap is every year. But I think uh, what Unfounded really showed me was getting into the specifics and specific entities is, is really kind of one of the most effective ways to make, to, uh, to draw attention to, to problems, because if it's so big, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. So I can tell you, you know, what the gaps are at Western University, what the gaps of the, at the dean level, at the assistant professor, uh, associate professor level is at these specific entities um, based on these sunshine list records. Um, there's nothing in those records on sunshine lists about parental status. So that wasn't um, something we could look at. Now we did spend a lot of time talking about the, the mommy tax and the impact that children have through kind of anecdotal reporting. And so this is really something that you can do as a journalist is, um, and what I certainly have, have done in, in recent years uh, is I have kind of a uh, a foundation of data that I can then build anecdotal reporting off of. Um, if you only have the anecdotal reporting, I think a lot of people can dismiss it um, uh, as just kind of one off. So they're they're really a, a, a kind of a, a perfect marriage, I think, in how you kind of construct these types of stories. And um, uh, with regards to the gap, was there enough information between men and racialized women to see any trends? I mean, again, so with racialized women, um, the I'm trying to actually see if I can pull up the number. There were so few racialized women who made it to the um, who made it to the top that it it was very hard to draw any uh, any broader conclusions from. So, for example, in the top one percentile of earners, there were um, 1,059 people in, in who who kind of met that uh, that bar, the top one percentile across our data set, and we manually researched all of those people to look at their race. Of the 1,059 people, um, 289 were women. Of those women, 27 were BIPOC women. And we, we, we also couldn't, we, we ideally, we wanted to divide up um, to look at whether uh, an individual was black or indigenous. Um, and that wasn't possible either because the numbers were so low. So uh, I think that that is, um, is, the, is the headline is there are just so few racialized women at the very top that we couldn't look at it. Uh, we also tried to do this with, with law firms. So when I was going through Blake's compensation data, um, could I look at the gaps between the racialized equity partners and non-racialized equity partners? And, and, I, and, and I was even looking at, um, at men as well. And what I found was there was no one, there were so few, like, um, I, I wish I remember off my head. It might've been like four or five out of, out of 200 um, women. Um, there were so few that actually disclosing it would have really violated their privacy, I think. And again, these weren't people, th it's, this is, um, you make those different calculations when you're doing this job. Um, these were not people who kind of asked for their company's data set to be leaked. And I, they're, they are not the people that I'm trying to cause problems for in this story. So that was a kind of a, a judgment call that again, there were just so few that it wasn't even possible to, to make meaningful analysis from. Um, other, other questions here. Do you want me to just read them or I don't know, Melanie or Zoe, do you want to read them? How would you like to do this? It's up to you. I, I mean, I was just trying to cluster the ones that are were about the sort of the data set itself okay. so that we could sort of have you answer them thematically. But um, I mean, I'm kind of all over the place here on this. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, there's so many threads to this analysis. It's really helpful. Um, there is another question about, oh, there's a number of questions. Another question about female names from various ethnic groups that may not have made the cut. I think maybe that's just sort of an addition on what you were pointing to already. So, yeah, we um, we looked at that. The, these we did make we did try to make all these considerations. Like, were there suit certain um, ethnic ethnicities that were going to not be reflected in the data set? Um, because of this, and we found that it was not a meaningful. Um, swing. So for example, we, we tested this type of thing by, um, and, and I am not the data persons, uh, my colleague Chen 
did this for us, but we could look at groups of names that were really popular and manually check statistically significant samples of them to see if they were going to swing one way or the other. And um, uh, anyway, we, we did not find that um, names that maybe were not Anglo rooted uh, were going to be disproportionately disadvantaged in this analysis. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. And then there's two, there's two questions in a bit of a, a different direction away from kind of what the data showed and what variables you were able to look at that ask about <clears throat> advice and recommendations. So one is, do you have any advice to women and members from other historically disadvantaged groups about how better to negotiate um, successfully for equitable compensation? And the other question is somewhat similar, which is why I'm grouping them together so you can sort of think about the answer. Um, throughout your research, did any of the women you spoke to have advice for other women who will be working at law firms or corporations on how to navigate exactly these difficulties you've identified relating to promotions and climbing the ladder? So it's about career advancement. Yeah, and big questions. I mean, yeah. I already said, I think transparency is like one of your most important things if it's possible to find. And that might be, you know, getting your employer uh, to or your predecessor to to disclose it or uh, checking a sunshine list. These are not options in the real world. A lot of the time, I think, you know, if you're if we're it, often we look at, you know, if you are trying to be a good colleague, a good ally, um, tell people what you make. And, and now there actually were laws in many places against doing this. And then there was going to be a policy that actually prevented companies from um, banning people about talking about their salaries. And I believe the Ford government uh, killed that um, shortly after taking power. But that was something else that I found um, that, uh, that was helpful. I think the it's this really um, difficult dance, right, uh, in your negotiations um, that uh, I heard people who said that they they hired a headhunter, they hired a career coach, um, and that this was really beneficial to them because the people who are doing that work know what other people are making and can give you advice on it. So I heard that from a number of people who were um, taking really like kind of high level jobs. Um, I think I think workplaces like uh, workplaces know this is a problem and law firms certainly know this is a problem and they are making great strides to fix it. Like I do think at this particular juncture, especially at the lower level, I don't think you're going to encounter that. And at Blake's um, and Castle's, again, the and Aaron and Bearless, the newer equity partners, the gaps were not there and firms were often pointing to this saying, look, we fixed the problem. I mean, to me, the test of whether the problem will be fixed, I think, is in 10 or 15 years when, you know, people at the bottom are always paid the same. It's about how people advance. And even though they're equity partners, they're still at the bottom of that rung. So it, that'll be the question. Um, and I'm not really answering your question. And that's because I don't know if there really are good answers other than find mentors and sponsors and people in your world that you can strategize with and network with, because I think that the strategies change based on your employer a lot. Okay, thanks. I like the um, the title of this series, The Power Gap, because I think people often disaggregate this, this sort of the dry statistical stuff around representation and compensation from the implications of power, personal power, situational power, structural power. So I don't know if you have any comments on that. And I also wanted to ask you what aspect of your findings, I know there was all kinds of them, was most unexpected and or most troubling to you? Well, that's the second one first. Um, on the data front, I was uh, really surprised at the, the representation gap for women. Um, I, I think I was expecting a salary gap, um, but you know, we looked at specific job titles, right? As I mentioned before, so you might see like particularly municipalities were uh, core government was a really good example of where you might get like a two or 3% gap of, um, for individuals and, oh, that's not really a big deal. But then you look, oh, but 75% of the people at the director level are men. 
And like that, it's like, oh, that's, we're, we're focusing on the 3%, but that's not the issue. It's the 75%. Why are there not more women at this end? And this kind of brings me to my second point um, that really surprised me was the pregnancy discrimination stuff and, and the motherhood tax. Uh, and I think I, I didn't understand before doing this series how often women are fired or demoted or let go after disclosing a pregnancy. Like, I just think I didn't realize that that stuff still happened, but yeah. so many of the cases that I looked at were about this. And the problem, of course, is that it's really hard to prove it's because of a pregnancy, right? Like, oh, we were just strategic. We were just downsizing. It happened to be bad timing. Um, but when you actually get into the guts of some of these cases, you know, one, one case I looked at um, involved um, a woman who went on maternity leave and she was um, uh, um, laid off while on leave and a, her job was basically posted again and she tried to apply for it and they, you know, didn't want to give it to her. And um, I hope I'm recalling this correctly. I, I wrote about it in the story in case the company's going to sue me or something for mis <laughs> mischaracterizing it. But in, in a text message, she asked her old boss, like, why, why did you not consider me for this? And he wrote back, well, um, we didn't think it would be fair for your young family to have these demands on you. Like, these are the kind of things, and he put it in writing. So of course, I'm sure she got a bunch of money because of it. But um, these are the kind of things that you, that you encounter. And certainly that... Um, we've seen so much more in the pandemic where, um, you know, these traditional roles, again, we're talking about these gender silos of what a woman is supposed to do. They are the primary caregiver, um, not just for children, but also for, for um, elderly relatives. Um, and that's kind of our default. That's what we expect. And what was really interesting to me also related to this was that women who don't have children pay the mommy tax too, in a way, because society expects them to, um, they, they still kind of put them in that role. And then, well, why didn't you have children? There's a stigma of not having children. And are you broken? Are you defective? It's like a complete damned if you do, damned if you don't. And um, I was working on this as I had two children. I have a two and a four-year-old. So uh, have really been kind of in the thick of it while reporting on these issues and thinking about these issues. And um, the Globe is like crazy supportive with young parents. Uh, many of the senior people at the Globe have little kids, which I think is probably um, uh, related. Those the, the support that you get is related to the fact that the, the higher ups are also in it with us. Um, but I still encounter people like that are people like, oh, are you back from maternity leave? Didn't you just, weren't you just off or something? You have babies now? Like for some, I am, you know, a mother now. Like that's, I'm the mother now. And, uh, and uh, my male colleagues who have little kids don't have that kind of father stamp on them. I'm happy to wear my, I like being a mom. I'm happy to wear my mother flag, but it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing that can like just follow you around, whether you actually are, uh, you know, distracted at work because you're thinking about your kids or whether they're just projecting that onto you. I think these are all the things that I wasn't fully aware of until I started doing this reporting. There's a question from a graduate student in our program um, who thanks you for your presentation. And um, he's from India and he's worrying, currently working on the impact of foreign direct investments on the gender wage gap in the developing world. And he notes that this gap is much worse in countries like India where most of the women are employed in the unorganized sector and there's no data on the pay gap that ever comes out. So the question is, do you think MNCs investing in third world countries from the West, for example, Canada, actually have the potential to kind of bring positive change on the wage gap in the global South? I am very ill-equipped to answer this question because I haven't looked at it specifically, but I can just say broadly that uh, one of the main things I've heard from people about how are we actually going to have big change, it's when corporations start demanding it because consumers are demanding it. So I think that this is all kind of, if this is the expectation now, like we're not going to do business with you unless you have these policies in place, unless you have a, you know, some equity plan, um, you know, it, it translates into say factory safety in, in the developing world. Um, we're not going to place this order with you if you can't meet these, these conditions of safety. So I absolutely think there is, there is huge progress to be made there and potential for change 
on that front, but I haven't looked at it specifically in a way to, to be, you know, a reliable source on that. Okay, thanks. So another participant had a comment about um, gender at play in law firms. And she says that at an event regarding being a woman in law on Bay Street, a firm's representative encouraged that women who speak softly or in a high pitch learn to speak with more authority in order to be taken seriously. So I guess this was a schooling in proper, proper gender speak. Um, and she's saying that it's just one of many examples of how she has seen Bay Street firms encourage women to change their behavior in order to fit the mold in a patriarchal environment. She also has a follow-up question when looking at, uh, that's a comment, when looking at the gaps in law firms, did you have access to the hiring of articling summer students and the lower years of call? Uh, so second question first, I did not look at the, um, the art of cleaner summer students. Um, I did look at associates at uh, castles. Um, what was interesting about, uh, you know, at the associate level, you're more or less on kind of a set uh, increase. So there's, there's less room, wiggle room there. And the gap in actual earnings was, was very similar between men and women at the associate level. The difference was that the, uh, with bonuses, and in all seven years of, of, uh, of at the associate level, um, the men, the male um, associates uh, at castles made more than the women. Like they were given higher bonuses. Um, maybe it was all years, but one, if I'm being, if I'm remembering correctly. But it, like the 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 bonus level was was dramatically disproportionate to the men, which feeds into again, like when there is discretion to be had, it's going to play on our biases. And I think that that's maybe a good point to make too is. I'm sure there are people out in the world who are like those darn women. Um, they don't. They're. They don't know what they're doing, and we're not going to pay them. But you know, I maybe I'm being naive, but I think most of this stuff is is uh, is just kind of our unconscious biases playing out. Um, not to say that you know you can um, use your unconscious bias and uh, and wield your stupidity around with impunity here, but I think so much of this is just kind of like until you are forced to look at it and go, well, let's just talk about like, lo like logistically, like logically here, um, women have outnumbered men in undergraduate uh, degrees for decades. More women have graduated with master's degrees since the nineties. Um, as of 2018, women and men were make, were, were graduating at almost the exact same level of PhD uh, with doctorates, um, law schools, women have outnumbered men, uh, men in law schools for years. So let's just like play that out. Then this doesn't make sense, right? Like the stats don't make sense. The representation doesn't make sense. The leadership doesn't make sense. The, the wage gap doesn't make sense. You can explain away individual people, but when you look at the, the whole picture, it's very obvious that there's a problem. Uh, what was the other thing The Angeline, Angeline, uh, um, the, on the, uh, the, the learn to speak more authoritatively. So this is such an interesting thing uh, that I think is worth spending a couple minutes talking about. I remember actually in my first day of journalism school, we went around the room and uh, they had the, the women kind of, I think we read like a, hi, I'm Robin Doolittle and I'm reporting from blah, 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 like a placeholder thing. And they had the women in front of the men practice talking lower because women naturally raise their voices. And on one hand, I'm outraged by that. And on the other hand, in a practical uh, in a practical situation, the uh, the the person was coming at it from the perspective of you are more likely to get a job if you speak like this because this is how people want to hear you on the radio. And um, and I think what's interesting about this current generation, uh, I, I'm old now, but the current generation is saying no. I'm going to speak like this and you will hire me anyway. And that's a shift that's happening, right? Like that with the best of intentions, someone could be saying, listen, lower your voice uh, because it, it's more like, this is how people are trained to hear leaders. Um, and then the other generation going, no, you're going to get used to me talking in my natural voice or whatnot. So I think that that's a really interesting dynamic that's playing out in workforces where there is um, kind of a, a tension between uh, different generations. Yeah, it's interesting because what you're describing, what came up in the comment is the requirement or demand from people in power to conform to dominant norms. And that's one of the most insidious ways that discrimination works, right? So if we don't disrupt that, 
we're right. in serious trouble on all kinds but of you can practice. see someone like well-meaning like I, I i'm not saying her name but i remember the prof who did this exercise with us and she would consider herself a very staunch feminist and she's a lovely person and was not trying to you know play into she was not yeah. consciously trying to play into patriarchal norms and change women but that is effectively what was happening there right well, she's vocal trying to help. Fry, i mean same thing like vocal yeah. fry is a new thing since yeah. I've been in this industry that 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 when I was starting out, that was a major no, no. And now it's kind of an embraced. In fact, people actually like like lean into it because we're used to hearing it. That's what we actually expect our podcast to sound like. So I think that that's a really good point that's going to play out in, in this in all different workforces. Um, OK, thank you. So I think I'll give you a very big question for as we're running out of time to close. And that is, um, do you think women will ever achieve equality in positions of power? Really <laughs> a, a big and expansive question. And important. Um, well, the, the, <laughs> I hate ending on this note because it sounds so <laughs> dire. I mean, what are the odds the world ends in the next hundred years? Like, sure, we're going to have equity if things keep trekking along, if climate change doesn't take us out first. So, yes, I think that's a cheery we'll note, but it, it's a sobering, it's real. It is like that's, I think, because I've been right? asked this so much. I think, yeah. I think for sure we are going to have um, uh, gender equity, like much, much higher. I don't, I actually don't think. I think it will be very hard to reach 50 50 because of these very ingrained like roles around um, motherhood and children and expectations at home and whatnot. Um, but you can get close. And I think that that is, you know, 30, 40, 50 years away that it's going to keep getting better and better. Um, now, whether they're uh, almost all white women, like that's a big question. I think um, when you start adding in, um, you know, what is actual diversity. I think that this is a shift too that's been really positive, obviously, is you want your your leadership at every organization to reflect the population and to reflect the needs of serving this population. And reaching that, I think, is possible for sure unless climate change takes us out sooner. And I think we're going to have a better chance of dealing with climate change if you have leadership that reflects the population. Right, exactly. Well, thank you. On that sobering note, uh, <laughs> if the apocalypse doesn't get us first, um, okay. Well, I think I'll I'll close it here. And thank you so much for your time. Um, we really have appreciated this conversation. And I think I will hold you to um, another invitation for next year because there's much more to discuss, and uh, you'll no doubt have new work and insights to share with us. So, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you. Uh, Robin, very much. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.